Welcome back to the Indie Vets podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Heller. I'm the Chief Growth Officer here at Indie Vets. And I'm Dr. Marissa Brunetti, Chief Medical Officer at Indie Vets. Today, we're going to be talking about COVID-19 and how it's affecting all of us in a clinical setting, um, basically in general practice. And Marissa, as our Chief Medical Officer, has a lot to talk about and a lot to say on this topic. Absolutely. Um, so I, I want to interview her a little bit and talk to her about what she's seeing out there. The goal of this episode is to sort of highlight the differences in how practices are dealing with COVID-19 and really just to teach you guys like how to stay safe, how to stay sane. Absolutely. Right? Um, and really just pick Marissa's brain. Um, on on like kind of the do's and don'ts and what could really work for vet hospitals and for veterinarians dealing with this issue. I want to say hello to all the indie vets out there that are listening and to anyone else, practice managers or other veterinarians out there in our industry, welcome. So we're going to get started. Marissa, I want to start off by asking you to briefly describe how COVID-19 has affected the practice of vet medicine, just yeah, in general. Absolutely. Um, so just to reiterate, for people who don't know about Indie Vets, we are a group of doctors who are professionalizing relief staffing or temporary staffing. And so we have over 700 partner hospitals. And so we have the great ability to see what's going on in general, small animal practices from New York down to Florida. So I've had the great... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my dog's bone. <laughs> my dog is throwing her bone around in the other room. Um, anyway... I've had the ability to see how COVID has affected the practice of veterinary medicine in small animal practices, whether they're private or corporate. And I will say, I think it has had a lot of impact on not only communication, but our efficiency and our ability to see a larger number of patients. It's had an impact on already small and cramped practices or practices in cities or without parking lots. It's had an impact on vets and vet staff mental health. And the there's been an increase in new pets, which we did not foresee, but now makes sense as people have been in quarantine or at home longer, they have thought, oh, wow, I, I can get a puppy now. And so that's great. And we love people to have new puppies, but that's also made us busier. And so we've also had longer lines and waiting lists for routine surgeries and routine appointments. Just to jump in a little bit more on the impact on communication, at the beginning of COVID up here in the Northeast, as you remember, a lot of things were shut down. And yeah. though we are essential employees, a lot of people went to curbside appointments. And so what that means actually is that owners were staying outside in their car and we were just bringing animals inside and we were looking at them inside. And people were either calling, like vets were calling the owners and talking to them over the phone or doing FaceTime or some other video call, or vets would walk outside of the parking lot and socially distance from the owners to talk to them. But that being said, there is nothing like being in a room with an owner and being able to show them what's on their dog mm -hmm. or their cat. And when you can't, um, I think that makes it a little bit harder for owners to understand what's going on with their pets. Yeah. We already have a challenge because people don't understand illnesses and animals. And so it's really forced us as vets to improve our communication, like written and spoken, because we're doing a lot more discharge notes too to send home with patients. So not only that communication, but like I said, with our efficiency, you just can't move that fast right. when everyone's outside and you're running back and forth. And so we've had to adapt to be able to have longer appointments so we don't get behind and also to see as many patients as we can without um, literally going crazy. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. you've seen, you know, I'm sure a wide spectrum of how practices are dealing with this issue. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the extremes you're seeing? Like, I mean, obviously we're going to get to what most people are doing now, mo most yeah. practices, but what are some of the extremes that you've seen, which is, you know, just for those out there that haven't seen them themselves? Once again, like I said, we are in the Northeast. And so I would consider this the beginning of COVID mm -hmm. earlier this year and, yeah. and now this second wave that we're having. So I would consider them two different things. But in the beginning, this was so unknown to all of us. We didn't even know if we were essential or not because veterinarians weren't on the original list of essential mm -hmm. employees. But once we figured out that we were essential, the interesting side of the spectrum where people didn't respond very quickly, you know, I've seen hospitals in the beginning not going to curbside appointments, yeah. allowing everyone in the building, which right. makes, you know, the staff and doctors uncomfortable, not supporting their staff enough or being as communicative as they needed to be, not being empathetic and not adjusting their schedules. I think that was the biggest thing was like, oh, we can still do 10 minute or 15 minute appointments. And, and that was obviously causing a lot more stress. Well, I definitely see it on the hiring side. I see a lot of veterinarians 
attracted to to what we're doing because we have such stringent rules, yeah. but also because like they're they're not happy with the way that their management has dealt with yeah. COVID nineteen and and putting in you know safety precautions and things like that. So yeah. I, I totally get that. That I, extreme is nuts. It is, and the tough part is is that obviously managers and administrators have a really hard job too. And this is something they've never experienced yeah. before and nothing that we've ever experienced before. So there's no playbook for it. And so if a manager or an administrator or a head doctor or something is not comfortable being very open and empathetic and, and really putting a plan in place, that's really gonna affect everyone else. So what's the most extreme like safety precautions you've seen? Yeah, so in the beginning, we had a lot of great clients and, and they, Instantaneously, I think what was most important is that they kept up to date on the CDC recommendations, the AVMA recommendations, and their state's requirements. The The tough part is that the states have used interesting language so that things aren't technically legally required, they're recommended. Some things are mandated. And so in the beginning, no clients were allowed in the building. Only the staff was in the building with pets. Everyone was masked. There was all there was social distancing unless you were working directly with a technician or someone else on a patient. They were disinfecting between every patient and deep disinfecting twice a day. And people were putting a plexiglass everywhere, yep. right? Like yep. at the front desk. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. If people and but see, that was in the beginning, no one was coming in. So right. that didn't matter. But now in the second wave that we're having, um, curbside has con some hospitals are allowing clients in, but certain numbers. So some states limit the amount of people that you can have in the clinic. And so they'll let one one client in with every pet. They'll put them directly in an exam room. Or they'll have plexiglass up with the receptionists and they will that's how they will make appointments or take payment. So so, so what's the average place doing now? Is that like yeah. pretty much what most are doing at this point? Yeah, I would say that depending on where you are, like like I said, we are we are all the way down into Florida now, but definitely the average of what people are doing is is really important, which is everyone inside the hospital is wearing masks, whether you work there or you're a client coming in. People are limiting the number of people in the clinic and they are disinfecting a lot, especially high touch areas like, you know, doorknobs and the places where clients sit exam tables, things like that. So I would say socially distancing, wearing a mask, and disinfecting are all huge. What about in places where they don't have cars, like Manhattan, yeah. right? Like where people literally walk to their vet and they have to stay outside. Yeah. What are they doing there? Are they are they putting up any like heaters? Are they doing anything like that? You yeah. know, especially as it gets colder? So we saw it the opposite, right? So like when New York City shut down and Philly shut down in the beginning, people were waiting outside and then it was too hot, right? Yeah. And so we we're seeing actually like heat stroke and dogs were coming in and, and panting a lot. And so it has been tough because people can't wait in their cars. And so they would take animals in and they would keep them in cages, right? Yeah. And so they could at least be, be cool. Yeah. And I assume that's what people will be doing as the winter starts to get colder. But clients, absolutely, like people were putting up tents for their clients to stand under. They were putting markers on the street so that the clients were socially distanced from each other. They were putting up little alcoves or like plexiglass inside their lobby so like clients yeah. could walk into there. So absolutely. I mean, that's been a huge deal because clients are already upset when they have to come to the vet, right? Their animal is sick. So throw in there that A, they can't be in there with them and B, they have to stand outside in either like the freezing cold or the sweltering heat. And that's not good for their mental well-being either. So I think the stresses, you don't think about these extra stresses that clients are having because of this. Yeah. So what, I mean, in your experience and, you know, you've seen it all, what are the, what are the three most important implementations um, that you would recommend, you know, for staying safe and sane <laughs> in COVID? Can it be more than three? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. So I think the number one thing that I cannot stress enough, and it seems redundant, but I have seen people not have it. It's have a plan and protocol in place. <laughs> I've even been surprised when certain corporations don't have a very specific plan put in place, whether they do or they're not communicating it or their hospitals aren't aware of it. I cannot stress enough that it needs to be written down the hospital needs to talk about it a lot. The staff needs to know what's going on. Um, and the clients should even know what's going on. That's number one. Yeah. And that has to be based on the corporation, or if it's not a corporation, it has to be based on, they all should be based on CDC guidelines and the state guidelines as well. So that's number one. 
Number two, I cannot stress enough about communication because I'm really big on efficiency. You can't be efficient without everyone communicating. So I recommend morning and evening huddles for the team or rounds. And that's when anyone can you're going to talk about who's doing what during the day. Don't huddle too closely. Though, Don't, right? Of course. <laughs> Good point. Yes. A socially distanced huddle yes. um, with everyone wearing masks with the staff, I think is very important to discuss who's doing what during the day because my th- – Third important thing is assigning specific jobs and sticking with them. And that could be, you know, a runner that runs back and forth to the hospital. One tech who stays in the back and just just does diagnostics. <laughs> My dog is in love with Andrew. She won't leave me alone. <laughs> I'm like trying to get her to sit here. And she's like, no, I have to touch you and I'll push you down. Look at this. Look, Louie. Louie, no. Get up. Get up. No. Okay. Fourth, I know you said three, but fourth I think is really important that if your staff is minimal due to sickness or something else with COVID exposure or something else, please adjust the schedule for this reason. You know, yeah. uh, let your doctors have a little bit more time. Let your staff have a, have a little bit more time because they're going to need it. Yeah. And then lastly, I think something- So just to go on that one, yeah. would you say like even leave like maybe a 20 minute space for like catch up because oh. things get- you know, I mean, we always do that anyway, yeah. right? Like in, mo- in non- non-COVID-19 times, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe now is even more important. Right? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And even if your appointments for that day are 40 minutes instead of 30 minutes, like you have to think about your staff's burnout for one crazy day. A, a, staff, a staff member can be affected for a very long time and that can really affect how they work and if they even want to come back to work. And then lastly... We say it all the time, but it's actually getting harder to do now that we're all masked up. Mm -hmm. But please remember to drink water Mm -hmm. (laughs) when you're working. Stay hydrated for multiple reasons and eat food. You know, (laughs) no one wants to be hangry, especially when you're running around like crazy. So those would be my five implementations that I think are important. That's all really good advice. You know, as a company, we at IndieVets have our own protocols, right? So, you know, what are the minimum standards, the minimum requirements that practices that work with us have to adhere to? All of our partner hospitals are made aware of our minimum requirements and all of our doctors are made aware of them. They're also on our COVID-19 resource page on our website, so anyone can read them. But obviously things have adapted since the beginning. In the beginning, everything was much more detailed, but then things started changing at different rates in different states. And so different states had different mandates. And so what it comes down to... (laughs) is our minimum protocols that we require our hospitals to follow and our in own indie vets to follow is that everyone needs to wear a mask when they're within six feet of an indie vet. Our doctors need the ability to socially distance from an employee unless working directly with an animal. And the partner hospital must notify us if they have a positive employee because we have very strict protocols for if our doctors are exposed. And rightfully so, because what I think is important to note is that our doctors work in many different hospitals. Yeah. And they they're at a higher risk. Know, yeah. They're, they have a higher risk and they need to know when they're exposed because we, we want our partner hospitals to be safe and our doctors to be safe. Right. I mean, you sort of alluded to this before, but do you think that this is contributing to a higher state of burnout? I mean, I wrote a blog piece on this, so I, I'm, sort <laughs> of set, that I'm sort of setting it up for you. But yeah, um, you know, what what why do you think that is? Yeah, I you definitely did write a blog post about it, and if anyone hasn't read it, you should go to our I mean, website. I have, I have my perspective on this, <laughs> but I'm interested in yours, Melissa. Well, we all know that vets suffer burnout on a normal basis right. with things that we deal with: compassion fatigue, crazy schedules, you know, um, hard times with owners. But absolutely, this adds a completely different measure. One, it's our conversations with owners are are longer. Um, And so our time is much more limited. We're also trying to keep ourselves safe. And so we're worried about our exposure as well as exposing our families. And so anything where you bring our own health into it is going to make us even more stressed out. And and we're trying to provide as best care that we can. Well, I've actually done a few shifts in COVID, believe it or not. And um, (laughs) I I do remember like it was warmer when I was doing it. It's now cold. Um, That gives you an idea of when my last shift Hmm. was. But when I had to go out and see the owner, I didn't like the whole phone thing. Same. I just felt like it 
it was so disconnected. Yeah, right? and it's and hard I, to go over estimates, right? right? Like well, it's hard to show I, people. Right, and you you know, I'm used to um, connecting with people like, you know, visually. You mm-hmm. know, I want to see their reaction when I tell them what's going on. Or yeah. If I do give them good news, I want to make sure that they understand that, you know. So I would go out to the car and then if they say, well, I want to go ahead and do the next test or whatever it was, whatever diagnostic, then I went back inside. Mm-hmm. I did that. Then I had to go back out mm-hmm. and talk to them. Um, and, you know, eventually that gets tiresome. It definitely slows you down. And, you know, then you have to start deciding things, right? Making these decisions without going out there. And then you get this decision fatigue mm-hmm. as well, which, which oh, can certainly point. Great um, point. Be, just be tiresome, right? And that's, that definitely leads to burnout. So that it's was exhaust- my two cents. I think exhausting is a really good word. Yeah. You know, we're finding that our doctors, they're busy too, right? Yeah. Like, like I said, there's more pets. People are home with their pets more. So they're noticing like, oh my God, has he always had that bump on him? Right. And so they're they're bringing in their pets more. And so not only are we, yeah, you're right, having decision fatigue and having and it taking longer to do everything, then we actually are seeing more pets and trying to fit them in. Right. So I do think, you know, there's lots of generic things that people say to avoid burnout. Right. And I really, I really don't like all the generic things, right? right? Like we all know we need more sleep and right. we all know we need meditate. to eat right. Yeah, <laughs> we all know we should meditate, but oh my goodness, like right. I, I can meditate for like a good 20 seconds. I'm just gonna be honest. So a couple things that I've found to be helpful is commiserating with other vets. Right. I mean, like let's <laughs> just, like literally we're gonna start having just open teams meetings where like people just come to bitch if they want to. Like right. I also, non indie vet related, have three best friends from vet school that are all vets in general practice or specialty practice. And we make Zoom meetings to to talk about work and just bitch about it, you know, about how hard it is to be a veterinarian. And I think that that's really important. And and don't act, you don't even have to have an agenda. You can j- literally just trade terrible euthanasia stories, which I was doing the other day with a couple of vets. So that's number one. Number two. I think just knowing other people are in the same boat as you yeah. always makes you feel better, right? When you feel like you're the only one out there with this issue, you can feel lonely, especially in today, today's mm-hmm. time when we really are lonely. So, you know, getting together with people, like you said, I think doing video chatting and just yeah. talking to people more, calling yeah. people. I was really good about that at the beginning of COVID, yeah. by the way. Like I was Same. like calling people I hadn't talked to in so long. I had all this extra time. Mm-hmm. Now this has become sort of the new normal. And now I've kind of like forgotten about that stuff. And we so do it's have, important we, to remember to do that. True. But we also do have video chat fatigue, right? Like yeah. we do have Zoom fatigue. And that's why I think just you're right. Calling is is important. Te- even texting. Like, yeah. c- like a text chain with a group of vets is important too. So – Commiserating with other vets, obviously, you really only have one choice, and that's to hang out with the people that you live with, pretty right. much. But <laughs> but doing something different, you know, like I walk my dog so much, um, and that's not something I, you know, was able to do that much right, of right. before. And I encourage my my brother to go on walks with me or hikes with me. Something that and you, you know, can make phone calls too. I, call your friends. I do call all your time. friends while you're walking, right. which goes to my third thing, which is like I said, drink water and move around. Right. And I remember in the beginning of COVID, I was so, I mean, Andrew, you can tell people how upset I was when my gym closed. Oh, yeah. Like, did I get so depressed? You were in withdrawal. I was. I'm still kind of in withdrawal. And so we've had to adapt to that. But even if you just go out and walk your dog for three miles a day or one mile a day even, like, you're you're getting up and you're moving around. Well, I was going to ask you, like, are any of these things that you're talking about like good to keep even when we don't have the pandemic? And of yeah. course, it sounds to me like, yes, you know, I think all these things, I think that, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm always the optimist if you people out there don't know me very well, but I'm always the optimist. And I was going to ask you, like, do you see any silver linings to this whole thing? And I think that's yeah. definitely one of them, right? Like, yeah, I think, you know, developing different coping mechanisms is a really good outcome right. of this. If, if you do develop them, I think. One thing that I forgot to add about avoiding burnout is seriously talk to a therapist virtually. There's lots of apps now that you can talk to a therapist if you don't have your own personal one or a counselor. Like these things are important and easy to do now because it's virtual. And so you don't have to go to an office and sit in a waiting room or anything right. like that. It, it's very easy. And we we really encourage that and, and are open about our own therapy that we've been to and through and still are in. And so I think all those things – should can and should be carried over into quote whatever life comes after COVID-19 but in the veterinary world I think there's a lot of great things that will come out of this if we allow it to and a couple of them are disinfection protocols Mm. like we realize how much we don't clean in veterinary (laughs) medicine 
Mm-hmm. And so hopefully we'll keep the disinfection protocols um, and the important good changes to the practice efficiency and the flow. Like, And I, ho- I hope we retain high levels of empathy for our fellow workers. I mean, we all care about animals, but the empathy that we feel for our fellow workers during this time I think is really important. And I think if we let it, this is going to make us better veterinarians, right? Like our Think about when a client is now in a room with you. Yeah. How much easier is that going to be, right? It's almost like we took for granted that whole aspect, that whole relationship between the yeah. vet and the client. You know, I, I remember hearing at the beginning of COVID, people would be like, oh, this is so great, like curbside. I never have to see clients again. This is right. this is how vet medicine should be. And now I think we're hearing the opposite. Like yeah. we miss the client being in the room. Yeah. I think that's really important and something to remember in the future when, <laughs> yeah. when, when they are back and they're, and they're frustrated <laughs> with these people. Exactly. Yeah, but I think, you know, our, our communication is going to be improved. Our camaraderie um, is going to be improved. Our flow through the hospital, our disinfection procedures are definitely going to be improved. So I think if we if we allow this, some really good things can can come out of this transition and, and these adaptations that we've had to make for COVID. Yeah. You know, this is bringing us back to kind of like square one. And I think we're going to be able to kind of, this is like the real great reset, right? Like, yeah. This has made us all even more grateful for the team that we have and these relationships that we have that have carried through this pandemic. So thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Marissa. <laughs> it was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. And I was going to say also, um, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to COVID-19 and hopefully it's coming to an end soon. But um, <laughs> if not, Sorry. we'll be having more of these podcasts. <laughs> and please visit our COVID-19 resource page. You can link to it from our website. Yes, and I definitely want to talk a little bit about, on another podcast, the survey that you put out to our own doctors about how they've been affected and some of the things that you learned from that. Um, yeah. I think you incorporated some of it here today, but I think there's a lot more to it that I'd love yeah. to delve and I into. Would, absolutely, and we have a lot of good plans for 2021 that are even making it much better to focus on mental well-being. So yeah, would love to talk about that at a later time. Great. Well, thanks for joining us today, and remember to subscribe. Thanks, everyone.